just rolled in just in time to be here so i guess we'll probably from looking at the program shift the gears a little bit but uh primarily my my focus here today is just to bring awareness of what's happening in the ag industry uh as it relates to data and why big data is up there what you find out is that in true sense the ag industry is not kind of cultivated the ability yet to kind of have a big data solutions as we see in some of the uh other industries out there retail sector and uh, medical sector specifically what i do want to do is just kind of give you an idea of what capabilities what kind of things are being collected specific to data today but to kind of start this is, uh, uh, from my viewpoint, what's happening now, and we're talking billions of dollars, $4.6 billion were spent in 2015 as it relates to ag technology. Probably three-fourths of that can be contributed to country, uh, companies building digital tools or data services out. This year alone, we're almost $2 billion at uh, the six-month mark or through two quarters. Uh, Two billion dollars has been invested this year in ag tech. It's going to be down from the 4.6 last year, but the point is there's a lot of people using tools that are going to utilize data uh, as an input. What we have today, I'll use the planner here in a second to, to give my example. We see a lot of electrification on machines today. Why? Again, I understand that that is fairly slow, but it is there. PWM on uh, Pulse today. We got three commercial companies that are supplying that. Uh, could have a fourth or fifth here in a soon to, to provide that prayers. But the idea is, as we electrify resolution down, we're going to be able to control mechanisms on the machine more accurately. Uh, um, we're going to have automated machines, and when I say automated, we have machines machine to enter cover that here in a second as an example. Uh, that's real today. We recognize that all power machines, regardless of color today, are rolling out of the factory connected to the internet. Now as a grower or someone that leases that machine, that's up to you as whether you want to carry that forward and utilize that. Uh, in some cases, I would argue that a lot of people don't recognize that it continues to be connected to the internet. But when we look at tractors and harvesters specifically, now sprayers out a couple companies rolling out. Uh, still, we're, we're in this state of agriculture. We'll talk about today. And uh, my definition of prescription agriculture versus precision ag is quite simply data is going to have to be input into something in order to get information or recommendations back. And so we see a lot of companies, the Climate Pros, the Circus, those kinds of things where data has to be supplied in order to get recommendations or information back. That's prescriptive agriculture. A lot of haven't worked, looked around. Maybe you are in the industry. Dashboards, but the ability to look at data, data streams, weather included in that is, is uh, continuing to grow. We see this integration. Imagery today. You can go to platforms today. So I have all that information in one app or one central online platform that I can look at all my data. And that includes my agronomic machine data. You can talk about that in a second. So we see this, this uh, uh, kind of integration of agronomy or this attempt to bring a digital tools around agronomy and technology together. I live it every day. We're learning about it more and more. This is all I all I see behind environmental more specifically about sustainability because there's still a lot of small food processing in Ohio. Data has to showcase by the So we got have data growing pains. I don't want to remiss I would be remiss if I didn't say that, but then Compatibility part of where it exists today and creates challenges in action. If you haven't seen this, I just want to kind of get you to think we can create, we can generate today. Our Ohio farmers are actually, some of them are above these numbers, but we can contribute a half kilobyte of data per plant per year. But the 
today, but to as applied the yield, some of the other data that's being collected, a half kilobyte. If we add in the weather, some of the soil moisture, water applied, kinds of kinds of that we can at the point of spot. And then I'm not sure if you're out in your area, but imagery has become a big thing in our area and we can increase that number. We're generating somewhere between 10 and 12 kilobytes of data per corn plant per year. So a lot of data, but the key is here, if you don't, if you don't keep up with this and why there's a lot of activity around, only about 80% of the data is in a form that can be used. It's being collected, but for most cases, it's not in a usable form. There's our corn planter, and my point is this is, is that tractor's connected to the internet? And that planter's connected to the internet. Okay? That tractor alone, when it's driving across the across on a can, uh, is generating over 900 messages per second. 900 unique messages per second. One third of that is available to us. Only one third of that data is available to be utilized or collected by us. Uh, this is a 16 row or 40 foot planter that we're using. Of course, it's all uh, tech down primarily with precision and some prototype stuff, but it's not like what we've got going on there 16 one row planters. We control each individual row, both on the high replacement, on the, on the population, the inferro, and the 2x2 two two is all being controlled on a row by row basis. I'm not here to advocate that's what everyone needs to be doing because we're in the research business. My point in this is where we are with the technology today. Okay? And so for this setup here, a lot of fields, again, just testing and developing some, some prototype stuff. We were carrying four prescription maps to operate that planner this year. Okay? And so we're map, and then ultimately we're looking at some rope cleaner prescription maps. So next year we can possibly on some fields to run that uh, actual plan. So again, my point in this is there's a lot of data being generated. Technologies arrived. A lot of the technology I'm alluding to on this planner is commercially available. We're just testing on some other pieces. Uh, but that's kind of where we're at. Uh, I'm not aware of this, but you hear the ones we think about. This new area that we get in two years, uh, talk about the machine. I'll give you an example of that here in a sec second. But that's Okay. Again, I'll give you an example of that. Machine data, a lot of information we collect, collected. Okay. Finally, we have remote sense imagery. And if you haven't noticed, I keep alluding to four companies. Basically, those four companies are to see who can combine all these. Right now. Just legally, all the machine manufacturers are keeping agronomic data separate from the machine data. And what I mean by that is John Deere case or Ag collect that data, they have access to the machine data, but they got it. Hey, legally, the only data the the OEMs or the machine companies are looking at is the machine data running coming off the uh, machines and implements specifically. So, we all know this, for the most part, if you've been around Precision Ag, we've got our yield map, we've got our as planted map, and this example is from uh, just a Precision, uh, the Climate Yield View uh, app. But again, uh, quite a bit of data that can be collected and archived and used. Agronomic data. The planner I showed you, this is machine data. And this is actually clip of a light. Most of you, you have machine data that comes off. Think about it as a dashboard in your car or anything else. You basically are getting that feed into a live app. So I, I took this 
uh, right out of my app, sitting in my office, off my iPad. But all that data is collecting, okay? And there's opportunities there. Uh, I might know. I'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow. I've uh, been able to basically identify the actions of a field very quickly using this data, but also look at really identifying efficiencies and bringing that very quickly uh, on different operations. And so there's some value to that. It's just trying to get it in a form and feeding it back to, to the growers, the agronomists helping uh, on this. So I just put an example in. We talked about soybeans right here, uh, but this is a soybean example. Uh, basically, we ran a, a I'll use point. hybrid A. And what you see up there is uh, five bushel. So five bushel statistical difference between the in that particular field. Nothing new. Uh, we've done this for years of running on research. The interesting thing is when I look at the fuel, we're at 17 gallons per hour, which is 14.1 gallons per hour. Any idea why that would occur? Is that a bushel difference? What's that? Green stems. Hybrid A is green stem, hybrid breed, dry down stem. And what you see, again, back to in this type of data very quickly, add that into the agronomy data. Scenario that, look at our ground speed. We try to cover gallons per inch. Bit different. More specifically, what I'll, I'll kind of start pointing you to is machine load. We were at 80% load on that engine or on that machine on average. That's on average versus, and I would, most of you, between 30 your machine load on your line uh, in a lot of the crops, especially in the beef. But we got the number difference would be on between the two. If you ran that out, there's a quite a bit difference in if we assume using variety A on a Another thing, look at the capacity. We're about just under 20 acres per day, or hybrid or variety B at around 10. What I'm trying to get you to think about is in behind the scenes, companies are putting it and looking at some of these scenarios. This is a pretty obvious scenario where we see some differences. And this agronomically and uh, push a difference. Depending on here, we might put some numbers and find ability wise we might have made a different decision in front of us on those varieties. Okay. Again, this is green versus dry stem it made the but necessarily how data sets can be brought together. We have connectivity doing That's cloud technology. Um, sit around and define that, but uh, Amazon Web Services or AWS. But AWS cloud services makes some sense. Will that grow um, and increase in terms of using cloud technology over companies? Uh, it's a lot cheaper. Apps that are going to be pretty prevalent. How we interact with machines, want to interact with people, and then ultimately how we interact with people. It's going to be growing. Automated data collection through enhanced tools. Of course, probably some of you know or don't know. Uh, we've got apps out there that can do population, state population. Uh, give you a yield estimate versus counting rows and counting uh, kernels down those rows to give that estimate. So those are the kinds of tools point. see a lot um, We're going to see an integration of all companies like Conservus, Granular, Deer, Climate, Iteris. Uh, I could go on. Seeing there's a lot more integration of the tools uh, and capabilities that you're trying to, to bring to the farm. Uh, but 
but that is for the most part a marketing decision at that point. So, um, with that, I guess I will shift to big data. This is kind of my, my business I've been trying to do. So that's what Christy right now is this evolution of digital agriculture. Okay. I want to sell away from precision ag. We're looking at a lot of a lot of companies, retailers, at least in our area, providing prescriptive services, specifically around seeding and fertilizer. Uh, and so enterprise agriculture, again, if you look at a company like Concern, granular. They're starting to, to really uh, uh, provide solutions around logistics and looking to cost on doing that at a field level basis. Okay, so as a grower, you enter quite a bit of numbers in, in terms of your cost. Uh, you can use some more in the enterprise which is really bringing the business piece and kind of integrating the precision ag and prescriptive services and cost at a field level. Aggregator data, uh, we kind of get into this big data thing. And so everyone keeps wanting to know what's big data going to do for the farm, okay? And I think we've already gotten some evidence out there, and I'll give you some example of companies uh, that are doing that. What's it going to look like? Future? Uh, one of our Ohio growers right there, what we say is the grower is going to be doing business with data with at least eight different companies. They will be sharing data in some with at least eight different companies out there in the future. We can take probably 20% uh, of our growers in Ohio today, and I can tell you they're probably doing business with three companies. Their seed guy, their retail guy, and then typically their consultants providing some scouting and those type of services. Okay. And they're actually sharing data. But in the future, probably to even have access to certain a uh, portfolio of product has to be shared in order to get either access to that or get recommendations back through that particular company. But that's kind of what we see coming in the future. Uh, we see that alignment that is uh, making it happen, uh, but we are going here in the next five years. Big data. Uh, I just stole this. There's a lot of different definitions out here, but this is the one that. Uh, Congress put out earlier this year uh, ref refers to the use of technology. The idea behind this, if as a, my typical big data definition is, it's not if you can put it in Excel, it's not big data, okay? Or access, it's not big data. Big data is much more advanced, much more complex than what we can do in Excel some kind of database like access. This is what people are trying to build out, this idea around big data. One of the limitations today is has the level of data capabilities forward yet, at least at this time. And there's already evidence out there is the bridging of public data. Okay? When we think about public data and we think the farmer field level type data that can be uh, collected with precision ag, the combination of that pretty rich experience about what you can predict uh, for that particular farm area. We see this with a couple companies already. Um, we've got some examples in Ohio with our growers and some of this. What, uh, what you start to combine some. they're published. So the mission, the um, data, this is, this is why you get a lot of around this, organized agriculture's information. So
submission of very similar short abbreviations and in Google. So let's talk about Google a little bit. Okay, when we think about big data companies, we think about the Googles, the Amazons, the Facebook, the Walmart, the Target. We think about the data streams, data information that they're you know what they can do with that. So they would know that in 2014, Google was working. Basically, had revenue stream of $6 billion. If you went out and looked at capitalization, $5.2 billion. In this country, worldwide, you can speculate out of those large capitalized companies are actually Five. Capitalization, this is a big thing if you get to understand in this. An interesting thing is everyone uses Google while we're sitting in here in this room. I mean, these are actually paid Google services in this room. Dr. McGrath does. Hopefully it's security on your email. No one else. So my question to you is that doesn't charge you a dime become worth billions of dollars. You thought about that? What's that? It's a little scared. That's what she said. Well, we're all happy about it, right? We jump on or log on and we need some information. Bam. If you use Chrome, it's even better. They get even a lot more information off your computer. Okay? And I'll show you an example of that here in a second. But I get you thinking about this. You know, the idea behind these large capitalized companies, most of you do not pay a dime. You might buy some products. I'll, I'll give you that. But in the grand schemes, they're worth billions of dollars in shaping the future of our society. How about this company? Probably one of the best examples of a disruptive company. Look at when they were a little bit old. I don't have their current number. Another thing, notice where Google Tell me what assets Uber owns. Has anyone been to New York City or Chicago lately? Think about this. Uber came on board. I don't know. Programs. This is the Basically, they got rid of the main assets and the liabilities around those assets and the new way to doing business. But at the pure sense, Uber is Obviously, you know, it's hard to find, right? Yeah, there's two right out west, but we've got you know, one in Maryland and one in point is here is I can sit here and tell you the Amazon. Okay. Uber itself, if you had Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll tell you how. There's two ways that Uber has influenced your life in 2015. Number one, they hired 20 engineers out of Carnegie Mellon. You want to know what was going on in Carnegie Mellon in the past probably 15 years? Robotics. Exactly. Robotics. Robotics for what? Agriculture. 
There was a tremendous amount of research dollars by the ag industry being put into Carnegie Mellon, and guess what Uber did? Going back to the comment about cars, they hired the top engineers out of Carnegie Mellon working on autonomy for agriculture. Hired them in one shot to do one thing, carry people around in autonomous cars. That has set us back to some degree, I would, I would argue with you. Another thing is, the board of directors, per se, even though they're a private company, are the same people to the board of directors of some companies that you might have heard about. One company named John Deere. One company's named Monsanto in St. Louis. I assume you guys may know who that is. The same people influencing the board of directors in those companies. I've seen it firsthand. But my point of that is, we don't think about this stuff, how it all connects up. But this is a data company. Agriculture. So we got this new age of doing business, OK? And so we think a lot about our farms and the data we're handling from our farms. But you got to think about it from that. What are companies? Why are companies fighting to merge? Why are they fighting over purchasing data or technology companies? And this is one of the reasons, number one is, when you think about what these companies right here are worth today, the more you have, the more money we make. You're not a customer anymore, you're a user. Income operations are unclear or kept offline. Anyone know what the primary money generator is behind some of these companies? probably advertising, but there's data sharing that they can use, they make money with. But you don't know that. Try and look that up and do a deep dive on that. Understand influences, understand behaviors, and ultimately deliver products back to that. Revenue sharing intended. Okay, there's a story of the grandma used Facebook to keep up with us and our grand or their grandkids. Grandma asked, that was our stewardship arrest. Why, you know, grandma's very interested, the story goes, in, in, uh, in Facebook, because they keep up her kids. But she asked the question, how do they make money? If it's free, it's so exciting for me to see my grandkids and keep up. It's free, so how's they making money? It's interesting. So these are influences. What about smartphone? Back to my tractor and to the internet. People recognize that now smart fridges are being handed out for free in some markets. Okay? You get a refrigerator for free, but guess what? It's connected to the internet. It's got a few sensors in it. Okay? Stuff the consumers are starting to pick up. I mean, who want, wouldn't want to fridge? Track consumption, deliver food, customer offers. This is data. I'll give you the fridge if I can monitor what you're doing in, in, internally to it. Does that make sense? Anything in agriculture that's starting to look like that? He said field view. You will see some things next year that will look very common. I'll give it to you for free. I'll give you our assets for free to some extent, but it will collect data. That is that is here today. So we're going back. Just an example. I never got online, and I haven't shown one picture that kind of aligns how all these companies are talking to one another and sharing data. But this is uh, basically a, a free. It's called Light Beam. You can get it. And basically, what it does is track who's on you when you get on the internet. And it can go uh, even if down and other information off of your computer. This is basically uh, July 16. I did this before another presentation. I got on the ad. Again, how's that influence you? 
What I'm telling you is there's already this connection in the industry doing the shared data. Okay? It might not be specifically to the level of what you do, but they will know as a grower what your budget is for input at minimum. There's already means that they know that you're purchasing, you're spending twenty thousand thousand on Pioneer. There's companies that will have access to that information in a very simple way as this. Okay? But AgWeb, 104 sites, 30 seconds, 104 sites watching what I do. If I was logged into Facebook, that would have been even greater. Yes, sir? Exact same thing. It's all connected up. Absolutely. I'll come back to your Amazon comment. I want you to do an exercise for me. Yes. What's that? Yeah. So he. Can you click on private viewing. Does that help? Yes. Yeah, so. In most browsers, you can turn all this off, or, or for the most part. If you're in Chrome. You can't quite get all of it turned off. Again, going back to the comment, you got to share something to get something. Okay? Um, but in the other browsers, Mozilla, um, Explore, what's the other one? Um, Firefox, thank you. Firefox, you can go into all these settings and turn it off. You can actually get a couple of these programs that will burn the, burn the relationships. So if they're trying to get to you, the, the, the software will kind of cut it off. It won't, it'll basically kind of like a firewall uh, for your browsing experience. But the interesting thing is if you're Facebook, you're uh, LinkedIn, you're uh, Twitter, if you're logged into those sites, which a lot of times probably a lot of us just, it just keeps logged in, right? They, they have access to, to, to your information at a much higher level than what you see here. I'm here. I'm not trying to scare you, but this is what the world's looking like. And you think of consumers and what we're, what, what, what's driving the industry, and what I'm trying to tell you is it's driving the way companies do business and develop their digital strategies out there. Because what do I want to look like now? If I'm, a, if I'm an ag company, what do I want to look like to keep my investors happy? I want to look like these companies. That's what they're and that's what they're telling me to these companies. I need to look like these companies in order to retain my and keep my investors happy, especially in this little law that we're going through. telling too many stories. So I'll just tell you, every once in a while I get to, to talk to investors. And most of these investors, these aren't venture capitalists, these are, these are uh, hedge fund investors. So these are big, big investors that are, are looking at these companies that we're talking about. And uh, I, I, I basically were giving them an update in the precision ag field and what costs were. And they really want to know what, what, what's, what are growers spending to, to buy technology and use Technology, both on the machines but also data. And I didn't get 20 minutes to do my presentation. I'll probably get in trouble telling you this. There's 200 hedge fund investors sitting in front of me. 200. And uh, and and all they wanted to know is about probably four companies in this country. Four ag companies. They didn't care about anyone else. And they just kept hammering me on, and, and they kept asking me, what does it cost? Okay, what does, what's it cost to have J.D. Lane? Give me that cost again. What's it cost to, to have FieldView Pro at that? It was just, what's it cost? 
What? And so they just kept hitting me, and I finally stopped. Stopped them halfway through, and I was like, for you guys in the crowd, I think I understand what you're asking me. How many of you, what, what do you think should be charged for these technologies? What do you think should be charged for these technologies? They were upset that, that these companies were even selling it. I'm not kidding you. I, I talked to, to half of them afterwards had to give them, and they just did never understand because of what I've been trying to tell you. Behind this, they don't have to. You give something to get, get the, the, the assets you want to make money on. And every one of those people in that room, you know where they were heading afterwards. They were going to talk to these companies. They, they had relationships because I've seen some of them at these companies, you know, learning What's your strategies? They want to hear about that and stuff. But anyways, I just tell you that to get you thinking about this whole, to drive home this idea that the Googles and the, the Ubers and all this is driving more than we think. We, we think about the, the field view, right? We think about our data and stuff. But there's this, this, this other thing that's working. How much time I got, Philip? Ten minutes per. So, so anyways, the idea here is there's going to be a lot of people tracking go into deeper with some of the technologies but so we've got connected machines I kind of told you I mean if you go buy a new machine today it's connected but the idea here is seeing a, a thrust around the world um, South America North America Europe Australia and New Zealand are good examples of this if you go down there and you just kind of listen and see what's going on is to connect the field Companies want to connect the field. They got the machine out there to some level connected, but the idea is on investments. To connect. A lot of that. Let's just let's just give simple examples: moisture sensors, temperature sensors. We'll keep that simple. It's having a weather station right there and having that accessible to the company and the grower, but it's connecting the field at a very high resolution. That's what's. Is don't ignore the amount of real time data being generated or collected. There's a tremendous amount being collected. I would probably suggest that most people don't recognize what all is being Another thing about using farm data, the learning about this space, again, I'm here to kind of challenge. It's already taken place. Back, you know, business, uh, you guys have uh, a word that makes it tough to farm to some degree. We're, we're growing rapidly in, around that, but you can improve. I do think some of these digital tools can do that. We can improve that. Sure, they're being good. The thumb drive, and I'm sorry, but the days of getting your thumb drive over and doing that, a handshake with someone is over over in some of these parts of the country. While the retailers use it and they, they have the best interest, the thing is, there's companies behind there that's connected up to make things work, to bring products back, and those data uh, agreements will allow for the sharing of the data in, in a lot of cases. But just be aware of that. Understand email and uh, kind of get you to think. When we think a lot of data, my point today is a bit of data being generated on machines. Not all that's accessible. There's a lot of data that can be collected today off of implements. Uh, but this connectivity and companies working together to bring this digital ecosystem together has already happened to some level. Granted, it's not easy to share data today, but they're they're sharing data. So, with that, comments. Questions? So we have you guys have any questions? Will be used to regulate. This is how do we um, 
how do we see big data being used to regulate? What I would contend, what I would tell you today, that's that's a great question with not a, a solid answer. But what I will say as growers uh, and agronomists or consultants that help growers, this is your time to stand up to, to protect that uh, and, and be able to offer it on behalf of that if you do have to report something. But if that doesn't happen, I think policy, and we're already talking about some things in Ohio, uh, if we do not get to that where the ag industry can report on behalf of itself and show the stewardship that's going on that I think a lot of growers are, are doing, then there will be policy in place where you're going to have to share and be more open than what you are today. So I think it's on our shoulders to, to be proactive in that. So the question is, how are they getting by through on privacy and constitutional? Well, number one, we have not defined a law yet that my knowledge, and I'm not a lawyer if someone's in here, but I'll tell you John's perception investigating. Number one, we have never said that spatial data provides is private data. Okay? If you understand what I'm saying. So we have zero policy it, we have policy around your taxes and financial pieces that you might um, lend to, to buy services your but when we think about this farm data there's not been litigation that, that defines that for us in my view and then secondly that it's just it's it's a free-for-all on that there is no, zero policy around that and, and to be honest with you, that is what the Farm Bureau is trying to argue for everyone on, on their behalf. They're kind of successful, but not in the grander schemes. We were just, just to give you an example, I, these terms and agreements change all the time. Usually about three-fourths away, and you can count on it, about three-fourths away on most of them, you can get down, and in the small print, they always reserve the right to share data with their affiliates or partners. There's always a line in there. It, I'm not saying they are, but there's evidence starting to creep in that says it's happening. Josh? How does that affect that? You know, we don't have a constitutional right to privacy. So people are aware in Europe, there are rules to protect privacy. So you're in Europe and you're probably on Google, you get a little banner across the top saying what they're sharing. And if only you're notified, and just in your business, Bill, Climate Corp, how many soil testing labs have they bought? Because they want the data. So my comment, Bill, is that right? Um, again, I go back to my speaker piece now because a lot of these relationships exist already. And the world's getting smaller in agriculture, evident of the consolidation. And um, when you get consolidation, guess what you get? You get a lot more connectivity going, a lot more sharing. Is there any companies out there that take these different technologies that are coming to the ground? Ask that one more time, son. Are you worried about the technology or the data itself? Yes and no. All right. Um, I'm just saying you're never going to get the Mennonite community once they, you know, if you're, so is there avenues for that? that not, not, yeah, not to my knowledge today. But, but I think there are a couple efforts out there that are trying on behalf of farmers to be able to, to store and be able to share data in a, a much more transparent way. I'll put it that way. But the, the, the key is, is if you're buying technologies from a company and, and using a telemetry device, device to push or pull data, you know, it's going to have to go through their system. Okay? But, but I would contend is that 
I would have doubt if any one of you running a, a business used just one technology specifically. And so the idea is, is rather than pulling that all into one platform, I think you, you know, there are a couple of efforts, and I could talk about that later, that, that are trying to pull that data together for a grower and say, you know what, it's not ownership, it's control. I control the data. Ownership's just a, it's an important ingredient, but, it, but you really want to control that, right? But if, you, if you're like most everyone, and you're using multicolored equipment or you're getting services from a multitude of different avenues, you just want all that together, okay? And, and then you can choose, you can have, you know, we'll just use me, you can come to me and say, hey, I want you to do my, my recs for me. Well, I, I need this, all right? You share it with me and I give you your information and it works. I think that's what we're trying to get, some of us are trying to get to. Not to speak politics, but what about the regime change in Washington? <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of time in the White House, and that's concerning. I, I can't speak to that myself. It says one more. I don't. I don't have an answer myself. I think it's just, sure it is. Whatever. We, do, we all say I agree. I agree. I agree. I gotta get the monitor to run it. I agree. I got field view. I agree. Right. I don't think there are very many people outside that don't have law degrees that spend. Time. And, and uh, for me, the only effort that I know of that can get halfway to that point is the transparency evaluator from American Farm Bureau. So if you're a grower or you're an agronomist or retail and you're really concerned about this, there, you can Google, imagine me saying Google here today, you can Google American Farm Bureau transparency evaluator and the point in that is that evaluator Companies put their terms and agreements through a process, a legal, so get back to your, if they submit their, the, it's a value, they actually answer questions, the company does, but then a lawyer assures that that is true as that relates back to the terms and agreement. You can go on there. I'm going to say they got 10-ish companies that have gone through that. That was new in 2016, uh, but I would tell you, the interesting thing is you'll see some common companies, you'll see some small companies on there, but note the companies that aren't on there. So I would encourage you, if you're really interested, that's the best way to keep up to your comment on, I'm not a lawyer, but I just want to know, the transparency evaluator. So, thank you.